7th. We are here with our friends from uh, the Environment Department, including Inspectional Services, uh, as they pertain to dockets 0559 through 0563. Orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, and appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, dockets 0564 through 0565. Capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks this is a public hearing, both being broadcast live uh, and recorded on RCN channel 82, Comcast channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. It asks, uh, my uh, colleagues and folks in the chamber to silence any ele electronic devices. The conclusion of, of the departmental presentation and questions and answers from my colleagues, uh, we will take public testimony. There's a sign-in sheet to my left by the front door. I ask that you state your name, affiliation, residence, and please check the box if you do wish to testify. Uh, this budget review will encompass over 36 hearings. We strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record in several ways. Uh, come to a hearing and sign in and testify publicly before us. Come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 5th, anytime from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Send your testimony uh, by mail to the Committee on Ways and Means, Boston City Hall, 1 City Hall Plaza, Boston 02201, or email the committee at ccc.wm uh, at boston.gov. Uh, I'm going to in, um, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. Uh, to my left, Councillor Ed Flynn, Councillor Tim McCarthy, at large, Councillor Michelle Wu. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, at-large City Council Michael Flaherty. To my left again, Councillor Lydia Edwards. And to my immediate left, Councillor Frank Baker. I want to welcome uh, Chief and Commissioner, and uh, it's all yours. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor, and thanks for having us here today. Uh, I am very, very privileged to be joined here with some of my colleagues from Inspectional Services, uh, who I get a chance to work with, as well as the teams at Parks and Rec, as well as the teams at the Environment Department, and happy to answer any questions that you have on, on that. These are just a few members of the Walsh administration who are focused on making Boston a more healthy, innovative, and thriving city from protecting our consumers through restaurant and price scanner inspections to issuing permits during the current construction boom, ISD has and will continue to play a crucial role in our city's vitality. And this year's recommended budget allows us to build on the success that we've had in previous years. In this budget, Mayor Walsh has recommended that we increase the number of our plans examiners to improve and hasten the service that we provide to our customers. We're also getting new vehicles to support our teams at animal care and control, as well as environmental services uh, for our road and abatement work. Although we're proud of the progress we've made at ISD under Mayor Walsh's leadership, Commissioner Christopher and I are dedicated to making further improvements to make the customer experience more efficient and make the city safer. So with that brief introduction, I, I thank you for your time. And if it pleases the chair, I'd like to have Commissioner Christopher give an opening statement, introduce the rest of the team, and give more details on our plans for FY19. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I always look forward to these hearings because it's an opportunity for us to talk about the great successes we're having at Inspectional Services. Some of the greatest metamorphosis about ISD is its management structure, how we implement work, and how we uh, record our accomplishments. It's not always about adding staff or budget to items. It's more about efficiently handling constituent complaints and concerns. Uh, the team that's before you right now is responsible for the analytics of the department, uh, and, and I'm very proud to say that they've done a spectacular job, and we really look forward to um, a good hearing. With me is uh, Mary Morgan and Patty Nyan. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, and we've uh, just been joined by District City Council Matt O'Malley. Um, you know, uh, you added how many plans examiners did you? We've add? added two plans examiners this year. Okay, and according to my review of uh, the differences between last year and this year, did you add four health inspectors this year no. and five building? No, we, we added five building this year. Okay. But not the health inspectors. And is that anticipation or is it in reaction to trends going on? It's, the department? It, it's, it's helping us implement a new program of how we're going to inspect buildings throughout the city of Boston. Previously, it was all based on wards where an individual inspector was identified into a ward. And I know a number of you, the council has got calls about us not having enough inspectors in a ward. What we've done is we've redefined the city into five major districts and we now have teams of inspectors that are working in those five districts. We hope to keep a common face in the wards because that does create a synergy that's really important for the relationship of our community with contractors and development. Um, and we've also, with the advent of the five new positions, are actually creating what we're calling a complaint team. Uh, a form of this has existed in the past, but this is gonna be specifically to deal with those concerns that come in um, so that we can address them quickly, as well as maintain a, a constant inspection program for the rest of the city. Um, to that point, uh, when you said quickly, I'm just thinking of a, a situation that literally just happened last Thursday and Friday, and I want to commend uh, especially Brian Rowan and Sean Lydon for getting out there. You know, somebody was preparing their yard to be totally paved over, mm -hmm. got the call from the, uh, the residents, abutting residents. Uh, they were out there the, the very next day. I got the call, I think, in mid-afternoon, and they were out there the first day. Uh, the next day, shut them down. Um, those are the kinds of issues, as you know, mm -hmm. that come up. And, it, you know, you don't want to come in after they pave it. I think it creates more of a problem for, you know, uh, rectifying, mitigating it, you know, probably fines and such, mm -hmm. if we can get to them. Um, before that happens. It's, it's always our goal, you know, enforcement through assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of the restructuring that we've done at ISD, uh, we're able to respond a lot quicker to a lot more projects. Mm -hmm. I love hearing, you know, the issues that are resolved within 24 or 48 hours. Um, in those that we can, we do implement. Mm -hmm. There are some that are more involved, that invo involve more housing and more negotiations. But uh, overall, I feel the department has, has become very, very responsive. And there's a whole um, ideological change that we are there to assist as opposed to just, mm -hmm. um, you know, issue fines kind of an approach. Are you, um, are you finding challenges filling a lot of positions, though? It seems like there, there has been yes. some. So is it a matter of just not being able to recruit the right people? Or well, the, the, there are two departments that uh, the skill sets are very, very unique. Uh, building inspectors have to come to the table with five years of su supervisory experience in that field. They're reviewed by the state for their certification. They then uh, have to pass an exam within, I believe it's 18 months, that uh, is state certified. Mm -hmm. In the planning and, planning and zoning department, uh, it's even more difficult because we have a higher bar that they have to attain. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. We reach out to a lot of universities. We reach out to industry. <laughs> Uh, there are usually two profiles of people that come into to our world. Those people that are at the latter end of their career and have a wealth of experience and knowledge, as well as those young people looking to build a career within the city. Um, let me move on and then I'll come around for uh, more questions. Uh, Councillor Ed Flynn. Oh, and we've been joined by uh, at-large city councillor Anissa Sabi George. Thank you, Councillor Siomo. Um, Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I just had a couple of questions. I know you mentioned the complaint team that you have. Can you give us a little bit of background about the complaint team as it relates to especially um, non-working, traditional working hours, whether it's weekends or after hours? Um, if after hours permits are how I spend my weekend. Um, there are a body of people that either through ignorance or by choice um, feel they need to work on weekends. 
Uh, there are situations that we absolutely allow it if there's a critical path involved in a project. If a contractor has worked uh, with the community to identify the period they need to go out and do some specialty work, if it involves enhanced public safety, the erection of a crane, or street cutting that would cause more public harm during the week, uh, we will allow that. There have been certain neighborhoods throughout the city that have asked us specifically to limit work in a very big way, uh, and we do respond to that. Um, we do internally publish a list of those uh, job sites that are able to work on the weekends. Um, if we have a question about it, we defer uh, the project to the Office of Neighborhood Services so we can make sure that the community is in understanding about what's going to happen. But there are also a group of people that just choose to work. I will not stop somebody who's a homeowner that's working on residing their house during the course of the week, and I think that's you know, totally within the guidelines of uh, zoning and the building code. But if it's a for-profit individual that's doing work uh, purely for the, the, the selfish reason of accelerating their schedule, then yes, we deal with that very, very quickly. There is a $300 fine for doing it. Um, if there are repeat offenses, I actually remove the building permit from the site, and then they have to come in and explain to us what it is they did and why they think it's okay. Thank you, Commissioner. One more, one more question. As it relates to um, animal control, um, we're having a, um, a hearing May 18th on the recent stray voltage incidents in the city of Boston impacting pets. Um, it's my hope that this session would allow us to work with the city of Boston departments, um, state government agencies, utility companies, uh, to try to come up with a solution um, about what's happening. Um, but do you have any background information that yeah. might be helpful to us? We're, we're very aware that, you know, the unfortunate age of a lot of our systems have left situations so that they, you know, the idea of a, of a dog being um, shocked is a reality. You know, there are two, two recently uh, cases, uh, and in both cases it was after a, a period of rain, Water is a great conductor. Some frayed or aged electrical lines will cause a problem. This is an inter interdepartment and also state and local and uh, a, a cooperation that's going to be required because a lot of the walking paths that are not on city land, you know, they do have lighting. And um, the only answer I can give you to this effect is the more we know about it, the more we can do it. I know the state and the Parks Department and DCR are all addressing this and trying to deal with their infrastructure. Um, but if it's an isolated case, we, we hope to hear about it quickly so we can work on it immediately. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Council McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome, Commissioner Chief. Um, just a couple of things. I always like to start with thank yous because, uh, you know, we do a lot of, an awful lot of work with 1010 Mass Ave and certainly an awful lot of work with ISD. So um, Colleen Kennedy, Lisa Coveney, Jill Cox, uh, of course, and uh, Chris Broderick have been instrumental in District 5, helping us, always answering our calls immediately, uh, answering our emails back. and. And, and so importantly, especially on the, the Lisa and Colleen, you know, they've been in constituent services for so long, they get it. And they get, they understand that um, when, you know, Mrs. Jones calls about a small incident, that might be the only time she ever called in 60 years. And it's not a small incident to her. And it's important that uh, Inspectional Services uh, answers the call. So I did want to give them a shout out and thank them very much. Thank you. And I want to make sure they call me back next week too. <laughs> um, my, I really have more concerns than, than criticisms. Um, like with Airbnb coming in, more and more students coming in, marijuana coming in, uh, the construction boom continuing. Um, I'm still concerned, and I've, I've said to you offline, I'm still concerned that um, you know, you, you're the athlete that's taking on more and more issues, more and more moving parts without enough people. Um, so I am concerned um, about how many people you have and how many people you're adding on. So you can talk a little bit sure. about that for me. Councilor, I, I hear about this almost every day from both staff in, in at ISD and constituents <clears throat> out in the street 
Um, and I think I stated last year at these hearings that it's not always about just throwing bodies at a situation. It's being able to analyze the situation so the resources that we have are deployed uh, in the most efficient manner. Uh, the reorganization of, of the building department itself is, is a major issue. Um, we have a senior management team at ISD now made up of 10 people that have all been empowered so that within their divisions they can make logical decisions, nothing is bottlenecked um, as we go forward. Issues like um, uh, the recreational cannabis, uh, the plastic bag ordinance, um, Airbnb, um, for the first time in a lot of administrations, we are at the table when these discussions are taking place. So the enforcement piece is always being analyzed and looked at. Airbnb is one that is, is not fully resolved yet. We've been going back and forth with the council um, to determine what is the right policy that we wanted to put into place. At that point, we will determine you know, what the right enforcement will be. That has not been included in our um, uh, budget this year at all because we, we really don't know what the magnitude of that is. Um, the cannabis situation um, is a very big one. We work very closely with our partners at uh, um, the BRA to determine what makes sense in terms of zoning uh, moving forward. I think we have written a really good policy around that as we go forward. Um, it, like many things, is, are in their infancy right now. We don't know how this is going to all play out. We've analyzed all the cities in, uh, around the country that have been dealing with it. Colorado being the, the leader in this right now, uh, we've modeled a lot of our answers based on a lot of data that they collected uh, in general across the municipality. Um, I think we're prepared to bring it on. Uh, but as always, we, as we move forward, we want to make sure that we have the ability to manipulate our enforcement packages so that we do it properly, so that it's not just haphazard or, or wasteful efforts. But I honestly do believe that the culture at ISD has changed radically. I, I give Mayor Walsh the credit for all of that because of the ideology, the response time. We understand that, you know, someone's small issue in, in the bigger city issues is no small issue to them. The staff I really have to commend because they treat each issue that way. Um, so I think that, you know, we're marching in, in the absolute right direction. Uh, through the management policies last year, we actually came out with a deficit in our budget, uh, which was really good. We've got staffing situations that are challenging. Mari, who is the uh, Assistant Commissioner for HR, she's constantly trying to find the right people to do the right jobs. I'd prefer to take a little bit more time to make sure that I've got the right personalities in that position rather than I would just to plug it with a body uh, and then I have to deal with those issues. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Wu. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to echo the thanks from all of our colleagues. Um, you all have always been extremely responsive and it's been great to work on such a wide variety of issues um, over the last couple of months. Um, I wanted to start with some of the um, performance measures numbers just to get a sense. So on the page where it talks about um, ZBA appeals filed and ZBA decisions filed, it looks like there's a, you're predicting a, a big drop in decisions and appeals. Is that just because there will be less projected, you know, fewer projects in the pipeline or it's going from you know, 980, 995 down to 750 and 600? Uh, in general, Council, I think that, you know, the way zoning is being dealt with now, uh, some of the newer zoning that we've written in, in South Boston um, is really lending itself to being more uh, developer friendly. I also think the educational piece about how zoning works uh, is, is helping us an awful lot so people are really sculpting their projects so that we can have more as of right projects rather than those appeals. I think that the planning and zoning department in and of itself has really prioritized how they deal with projects. If we can knock off some easier ones, we do, so the efficiency numbers go up there. Um, the Board of Appeals with the um, subcommittee has proved to be um, an excellent way of dealing with a lot of projects. So that those projections are not based on a limitation of new projects developing. We still see the city growing at a, at a tremendous rate. Thank you. Um, so overall, it's sounding like 
um, it's not that the uh, sort of development pipe, or it's not that the market is necessarily slowing down and that's what the numbers are reflecting. It's more the efficiency of the department and a move towards trying to agree on the planning ahead of time rather than sort of duking it out in the appeals process every time. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the restaurant inspections, a big decrease in the number of inspections predicted between um, FY17 and 18. I, I don't necessarily agree with that number. I think the inspections are going to be the same because we're required to visit every restaurant every year. We do see the profile of restaurants changing. Uh, that number fluctuates up and down. Uh, but I think overall, again, through the um, re outreach programs that ISD has done, we are having less problems with them. The actual number of inspections will not change, though. Okay, and how is the grading program going? It's going tremendous. Um, we see um, all the predictions that we had made in, in the very beginning. Uh, the number of A's coming out is tremendous. We're starting to see uh, a lot of tourism is, is using this information to select restaurants because they feel that it's safe and comfortable. Uh, and we also see that the restaurant industry has done a tremendous job about stepping up to the plate and being more proactive in, in their resolve before it becomes an issue. Okay. Um, so every restaurant has been through that now? Yes, at this every, point? at least okay. once, yes. And it's mandatory now. We're into the real phase, so the letter grading has to be posted now. Okay. Um, and then I guess just a larger question about, you know, given the pace of development, particularly in some of the neighborhoods outside downtown, now that we're seeing a lot going on in, in sort of District 5 and, and um, you know, further from downtown, what is the process like of inspections being able to kind of match and check to make sure that everything was built according to what was actually approved, whether it was the specific design <clears throat> details or the height or something else? Those, those standards have not changed at all. I mean, uh, we're in the ninth edition of the building code right now. Uh, the changes were really not substantive into that. There was more dealing with energy efficiency. Uh, is, is probably one of the paramount issues in the building code. Zoning, as I say, we are an active part of that discussion so that we're able to deal with issues before they become issues. Um, the reorganization of the building department for the actual field uh, inspections, we think, is already starting to show some real positive improvements. Um, under the old system, if your ward inspector was on vacation, you didn't get an inspection. Uh, we all felt that, that was unreasonable, uh, so what we are doing by creating teams, each team will have four, four or five, in some cases six wards. Uh, those inspectors will cover for each other so that you should not see a downtime uh, in, in the inspection response time. So just, to I would just, I wanted to check because the photocopy, it was hard to read the small numbers, but it says that in 17, FY17, there were 7,800 restaurant inspections and 825 projected in 18 and 825 targeted in 19. Is that just a typo? 7,800? Well, you've got to realize we have the projected, which are the uh, inspections that we know we're going to do. There's also a whole series of reactive inspections. Mm -hmm. That's a number that we can't control. I mean, every time we get the complaint, we're, we're out there right now. Um, I don't understand why there's such a huge uh, differential there, uh, but okay. I will check into that council and get okay, back to you. Okay, just curious. Um, okay, and then my final point was on uh, construction mitigation, and this kind of overlaps with the environmental and sustainability piece. So, you know, hearing a lot from residents, and you know, I hear about the one right next door to me a lot from the person who lives in my bedroom with me uh, about the uh, construction then causing dirt to erode all the way down in the street. There's sort of mud all over um, our area. So what's the ability to make sure that, you know, projects are not only get, getting built according to the specs, but then also um, with more storms, with more rain, mm -hmm. we're not seeing all, you know, the, the runoff then um, dramatically increase. With None of that runoff is legal. Uh, a construction site is not allowed to adversely affect its abutter, whether it be another resident or the city. There, each project that comes into us has to have an on-site storm mitigation program that they go through during construction. So if you're seeing an adverse effect to the abutters, that is a problem. And the, the sooner we're, we're notified, uh, 311 does a tremendous job about getting that information to us within hours. Okay, I'll talk to my district counselor about that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Council Flaherty. Um, 
And good morning uh, to, to everybody. Um, as the longest serving council, I have to say that, um, particularly uh, Commissioner um, Buddy Christopher, you've been the most visible, uh, the most accessible, and the most proactive commissioner. I know in at least my time here, arguably probably in the city, uh, where, and I can say this, many of your predecessors would be uh, chained to the desk, I guess, over at 1010 Mass Ave and would only come out when the TVs were rolling. Um, you're everywhere, and I think that's a testament to not only your work ethic, but to the commitment that you have to our city. Uh, and the mayor told me that was the deal when I came on. So. You had to be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And also having been on the other side of the counter, and I think that's a big part of that. And I think that uh, as we think about sort of uh, future, you know, leaders and, and commissioners and superintendents, that it, it's, it's, you've been a consumer, you've been on the other mm -hmm. side, so you sort of already had a, a jump start on sort of what was not working. And, You've made some great strides, and not alone. Uh, you've got a great team, folks that are here with you. Uh, but quick shout out to to Sean Lydon, uh, to Brian uh, Ronan, to Jill Cox, and to uh, to Mike Lyons. Uh, uh, obviously, all utility infield is uh, for your mm -hmm. team over there. They're, they're tremendous, and it's always on a late Friday afternoon, or it's a sort of sometime over the weekend, or it's a uh, first thing Monday morning. But uh, they get right after it, so. I just wanted to I, I appreciate that, Council, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are a whole body of other people that right. you don't even know their names of. Yep. Uh, the administrative staffs, the people that, you know, actually push the paperwork. We have seen a step up in the, in the quality of personalities at ISD that in, in my private life I never experienced before. So right. I, I thank you for bringing that up, but I do All want to say All those unsung that. heroes, Aisha, there's so many. In like Absolutely. Right the list so, uh, so if we can shift gears into the, and I ask this every time, it's, it's Boston's nemesis, it's the Norwegian rat. Uh, and I know that uh, we were making great strides with dry mm -hmm. ice, and then <coughs> somebody asked us to put the brakes on that. We're, what, we're what getting closer of? with the dry ice. Okay. Um, there has been a case in California where one company was given exclusive rights to promote and sell dry ice. Um, the uh, local departments here said to us, well, you can pursue that same avenue. Uh, that was not what the plan was. The plan was to make dry ice available to everybody. The chemical composition is dry ice. It's frozen CO2, that's all it is. Um, we are working right now, um, Kim Tai from my department has been working very closely with the Department of Agriculture. Um, we're getting much closer. Okay. It takes forever, but I, I'm hoping it'll be this year that dry ice will be just another tool in our toolbox that we'll be able to work with. Probably one of, one of the most effective tools in, in the war against uh, uh, the rats. It's environmentally friendly. It's yep. cost effective. It's all the right things. So we can get another, as soon as that hits the, hits, uh, your desk, I'll, I guess. There'll be a party, Michael. Okay, <laughs> this, has be awesome. this has been a long This has been a long one. And then shifting gears, we obviously inspect lots of stuff. We inspect uh, uh, bars and restaurants. We inspect um, uh, gas stations. But uh, do we inspect, um, you know, the dog grooming places? Do we inspect the hair and nail salon places? Do we inspect the massage parlors? There's, or or there's do we an, defer to the state on that stuff? Th there's an overlap. Uh, a lot of those are licensed by the state. Barber shops, beauty parlors, massage parlors. Um, with as far as the pets go, if they're ha harboring, I believe it's more than nine nine animals overnight. Their kennel, we certify the kennels as we go forward. So when we investigate these places that are uh, uh, certified by the state, we're looking at it primarily from a building and health point of view. We're not looking at it from a, a licensure point of view. Okay, is that something that we would give some thought to? I think we're in the best position, particularly. Uh, the local businesses that are in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, of having the city sort of oversee that as opposed to defer it to the state. Yeah, animal care and control has, has been really strong advocates, you know, for, for all of the pets in our city. Uh, and they do, they do a tremendous job of getting out there. Again, a lot of times it's complaint driven. They may actually be a grooming center that we don't even know about until somebody brings it to our attention. But yes, I, I think that that's something that um, warrants more attention. And we also have some shady stuff that goes on in barber shops and here in nail salons that uh, I think that uh, also warrants some additional attention. We've seen stings. There's been partnerships between the city and the mm -hmm. state and local and, and uh, state law enforcement uh, cracking down. It, it, it's unfortunate, and, and I would never target one industry. We see a number of uh, people that choose to play outside uh, the rules of the game, and we try to deal with them as effectively as they can. We have very close partnerships with the police department, the fire department, and public health to you know team a lot of these so that if there's a regulation that we can enforce, it may not come from ISD, even though we may be the lead in the case. Okay. And then just shifting to planning and zoning, um, just 
the last several years, but if you took the last year, how, how much money comes in with respect to permitting? Uh, permitting, I, I defer. How much do we bring in? I got too much paper here in front of me to figure out what any of it means. Um, I believe last year was in the $50 million overall. Oh, yeah, yes. For the, for the department. $68 million last year. 68 million. So 68 million come in, and it comes in in fees and fines, I guess, would be. It, it's all over the place, yes, okay. but the answer right. is yes. Fees and then and from fines. the development side of the house, what, what are the fees that the developers have to pay? Uh, the average per permit cost is $10 per thousand. There's a filing fee, there's an occupancy fee, fee there's a microfilm fee. Um, that's on the positive side of things. On the negative side, you know, there are after hours fees that, that come into play. We also categorize uh, fire escapes and building facades. And then there's the whole violation piece that, that comes into play. Gotcha. And that all falls under the 68 million? Yes. And so compared to previous years, is that on par or are we? No, we're, we're growing. Um, a couple of years ago, we saw a tremendous spike. Uh, but we, we are seeing it continue to project upward. And the average length of time when someone goes over to 1010 Mass Ave and files their paperwork to the day that they receive their... God, I, I wish I could answer that right. with one sentence. It depends on what they're doing. Uh, the reality is an as of right permit still is averaging about 27 days, which is tremendous. A Board of Appeals hearing averages around 75 days, providing there aren't glitches. Um, and that's the time that it lives at ISD. We are now tracking the time that if uh, a more information letter is issued because the package is incomplete, that goes back to the applicant. We don't track that time because we've had projects where we've asked for information and not got it back for six months. And then the complaint comes out to us, well, it's taken me eight months to get a project through. Well, it's only been at ISD for six weeks. Uh, and we're able to process it. So a lot of that is just the analyst of the data as it sits in, inside ISD. And then I don't see an execution of courts here. So when the inspection services get sued, which you do regularly, like obviously mm -hmm. members of the council get sued, when a car hits a pothole, we're sort of part of the corporation. So when they sue, they sue the mayor, they sue the council. Um, then who handles the litigation portion of it? Is that something that the law department now steps yeah. in and defends you guys, or do you have your own? No, within ISD, there is a, a law department that uh, comes under Gene O'Flaherty's uh, authority, but they are dedicated not only to the, the defense of ISD during um, those, that litigation, but also in the prosecution of housing uh, and health violations. But the only thing that's listed through the budget here is legal liabilities. It's listed at uh, F FY19 recommended 1700 Well, what's happened is, in this last fiscal year, the financial responsibility for the legal department has gone back to the legal department, yes. okay. and the staff is still dedicated right. to ISD. And though. when did that happen? About four months ago, five months ago. Because right. I've noticed that it's not, it's not in here, it's, so that's a, new that's a new change that you guys have sent sort of legal, legal liabilities, execution of courts, took it out of ISD, and sent it over there. Yes. And it would, it's a fairly significant number, I think, in years past, so. So then, and as I and I, do you take the company line on this one? But uh, I think I think you're understaffed, mm -hmm. and I think that we'd love to see more people just because of the volume. 68 million—that's a lot of balloons, mm -hmm. um, and uh, extra hands makes lighter work for other folks. But it's streamlining it, and it's getting um, you know the 27 days down to seven days, the 75 yeah. days down to you know, and then hopefully. Um, you know, that we can get stuff done. Well, we compare ourselves to other cities across the country, and we're actually right. doing pretty good. Or on average. You know, they, uh, we have been doing a lot of research about the, the business plan at ISD and how things happen, and out of that has come uh, a lot of reform to our processes. Um, and for right now, that's really where, where my focus is, is to have our senior staff team to reanalyze just about every process that exists at ISD, and there are a lot, uh, and we're, we're reevaluating them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Mr. I, I just want to make one point of clarification. The city is prevented from using dry ice, but residents aren't, correct? Glad you said it. Right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, just so everyone knows, bottles. I don't have a canister of dry ice at my house, just <laughs> so you know. I'm not going around the neighborhood yard. with dry ice. <laughs> um, and we've been joined by Council President Andrea Campbell, and I will now recognize Council Lydia Edwards. Thank you, and thank you for your work. Um, <clears throat> you took a whole line of questioning about the North End rats and dry house, dry house away, so uh, I appreciate that. And we did meet to, to talk, uh, the commissioner and I, and your commitment to not only 
uh, making sure that this becomes a citywide program, but also being willing to come out to the North End and help and work with residents if they so choose to have a private means of going about this. I want to commend you on that and thank you again. Uh, it just further demonstrates what my Councilor uh, Flaherty had said about your availability, your accessibility, and your, and your dedication. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to go through some questions, some specifically about my district, but also in general, just to help me get a little bit more educated about where you guys are working. Uh, my council, uh, my colleague, uh, Councilor Wu, had talked about your, in, um, your inspection of restaurants, and I wanted to know within that umbrella, uh, does that include pop-up restaurants? Does that include food trucks? And how are you adjusting to that kind of new economy? It includes any place that food is uh, consumed or processed on site. So the food trucks, wow. there, there was a program at ISD that we're a partner with the fire department to make sure the food trucks are right. all safe and certified as they go forward. Pop-up restaurants, which is a relatively new event in, in our city, uh, which the mayor wholly supports. Like, uh, we work well. very closely mm -hmm. with them. We've um, done things like, you know, like the taste of Dorchester. Right. The way that that was permitted before we thought was absolutely ridiculous because every vendor had to come in and apply for their own license. So, you know, again, through really good business practices, we've got it down so there's one application mm -hmm. that comes forward. Uh, all, the, all the vendors have to be listed and have to give us the data that we require, but the financial impact of it, it was always felt that that's usually for some sort of a charity or, or, or event that the money's going somewhere more positive. We saw no reason for us to add to that because we're able to achieve it under the one permit. Yeah, and I think that's great, a balanced approach to being able to assure safety but not, not kill economics Absolutely. or business. Um, and specifically, um, I noticed that your goal, that the, the department's goal this year for fiscal year 18, so I guess last year, um, was uh, to inspect uh, 4,800 units out of the 10,000 that are mm -hmm. registered. How, how are you, or did you, did you achieve that goal? And yeah, we, 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 our inspections under, under the rental registry program were uh, at about 7,000 plus or minus. So we are- On an annual basis? On an annual basis. Oh, that's excellent. And um, do you think that there's, is there something else that could help us, or that we could do to help you get to one day, hopefully, being able to inspect all the units on yes. a regular. What, what we're looking at is we looked at the rental registry ordinance in and of itself, and uh -huh. there are some edits and modifications mm -hmm. that we hope we'll be bringing to the council this year so that we can redefine uh, the goal for that. Understand that when the first 10,000 projected number was put into place, it was purely an estimate. It had no basis in reality. Um, and now we've had three to four years of really doing it, mm -hmm. and so we have some real numbers of, of what it's going to take. In terms of, and I, I'm, does your department deal with ADA accessibility with restaurants? Um, okay, it's it's not ADA. Sorry. I, this, is my, this is the lesson I give to everybody. Appreciate it. ADA is, is a civil rights law that we are unable to enforce. Only a right. judge can do that. The MAAB is, is, is a building code. Thank Massachusetts okay. Architectural Access uh, Board. Uh, yes, we are responsible to enforce that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do it both in the planning stages of the project and in the final construction phases of the project. Uh, but only new projects, right? So not retrofitting, a lot of restaurants who, oh, that in our They're neighbor. triggers, they're yeah. triggers, yes. So that if you spend $100,000 or more on a project, you have to have a path of accessibility mm -hmm. in, in the facility. If you spend more than, I believe it's 33% the assessed value of the project, you have to bring the entire project up to uh, accessibility standards so that there are gray areas in the middle that we deal with all the time. Is there a way to get ahead and hopefully either provide what we do for homeowners, some sort of loan or some sort of financial support to get restaurants to go ahead and take the initiative to become accessible? And I say this because in, in the North End there is a, there is a mm -hmm. particular person who has made it a business model to point out the fact that restaurants aren't accessible and to sue them. And he has, he's done quite well personally, and then uh -huh. he negotiates for that pay. That, that's all and done under the ADA, and right. it's all brought to court, and it's, but, it's but an argumentative could be, state. Uh, right, but I'm thinking if there's a way in which we just move our restaurant and business owners towards accessibility and provide them either the financial or some sort of 
method to get ahead of that? It's I think the biggest piece of that is, is more about education, mm -hmm. that when you're going to do something, you have to have an eye towards accessibility, and sometimes some very subtle changes in your plan and approach make a huge bit of difference to somebody who has mobility issues. Um, we're only too happy to work with them on that, but w we have no, um, no ability to assist financially. We can, we can give advice and education, okay. but, but that's about the limit of it. So just talking a little, talking a little bit about East Boston, um, with our growing population, I think in 2010 we were at 40,000. I think we're above that mm -hmm. now, and we're going to continue to grow with Suffolk Downs and all of these different areas of growth and development. My understanding is we have one inspector. Would we be getting, mm -hmm. no, we have more. No. Under this new plan that we're going, okay. it, it'll be regional, so there'll be at least, I believe, minimum of four inspectors assigned to each district. So and which we, district are we, one? Or uh, for, I'd for have you to guys? look at the map. The map's new. I forget what number we gave it. Is it is East Boston its own district unto itself? Or no, is it part it's, of? it's it, geographically we've redefined all the wards so that they abut each other. Okay. I think East Boston is a section of downtown and a section of uh, the north end. But there would be about four yeah. folks dedicated to that that issue. Are they spec Are they going to be? Um, have a specialty and that one is dealing with rodents. They're all one special. Is they're all special. Uh, but in terms of their, their dedication now, the, to... The education, the, the uniform education of all of the inspectors, they have to get, I believe it's 43 CEUs every three years. So their education is constant in... Um, That's we, continuing we try education. To make, we, for, this is for the inspectors themselves, mm -hmm. and we try to keep that information uh, flowing back and forth to each other. The biggest thing about you know accessible design is there are design alternatives, uh, and that usually ends up going back to planning and zoning, because now we're starting. Bu building inspectors are are literally black and white. It, it meets it or it doesn't meet it. Planning and zoning is 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 a little more uh, understanding in trying to lay out paths of success as opposed to just saying yes or no. And then um, tell me a little bit more, uh, I would love to hear a little bit about the ultimate fallout or ultimate ending to the building that collapsed in Maverick Square, if you recall oh, earlier. Yeah. Yep. And so um, it, was, it was brought by a developer and was under construction at the time of the collapse. I think that was on a Sunday. It was and a you Sunday talk, morning. You talked a little bit about weekend construction. Mm -hmm. And so in your investigation of what happened, what mm -hmm. caused it, uh, and then what, were there any fun? Could you help me? Yeah, sure. Uh, that project was fully permitted. <laughs> they were not working. They had put a bracing system inside the building that was marginal at best. Um, that's an area that's subject to a lot of vibration because of the trains in mm -hmm. the area. It's, uh, it's called a double width um, uh, brick bearing wall which is in and of itself has no lateral stability, whatever. Um, and what happened was, you know, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, one small section of the brick on the, the Maverick side of the building dislodged for whatever reason. I don't know why it dislodged, but that brick fell down. That was the first report we got Sunday morning around 11 o'clock. Uh, when we got out there, we made immediate assessment of the building. Um, and, you know, I, I had determined that the building was unstable. Uh, the bracing that was in the building uh, concerned us. We tried to work with the owner of the building uh, in my usual delicate fashion. Um, I told them they had an hour to give me a plan. What were you going to do? Um, that was not successful from the advocate's point of view. So then the city steps in and took over control of the demolition of that building. I saw no feasible way for that building to be saved nor was it worth saving, and in its original state prior to us demolishing it, um, it posed a real uh, danger to the abutting properties. We had to evacuate an apartment building, we had to close five businesses, uh, not to mention the uh, traffic impacts that we had with that. Um, again, working very closely with the fire department, um, we brought in structural engineers to do a very quick analysis. We made a prediction of what was gonna happen to that building. I'll be honest, I didn't expect it to happen in 15 seconds. Um, I thought it was gonna take a little bit longer to take that building down, but it went as absolutely predicted um, in its demolition. It was down within an hour, everything was uh, on the road back to reoccupying all the abutting buildings and getting traffic patterns back to their normal state. And the costs were? 
Well, I don't know if I can share that. Um, the cost of that, the city of Boston bit, bore zero dollars. The developer paid the entire cost of that. Which would include the fire department, would include the all, all of the fines and fees that were associated. And fees, and to then, include all the specialty equipment that we brought in to, to do that. And is there any then further follow up with that developer as they continue to buy and work? And the, how does, is there a warning yeah, system for The developer period? was involved in five other projects in East Boston. Mm -hmm. Every project was immediately shut down. Mm -hmm. Each project was then totally reevaluated. Um, the uh, fire department's, uh, well, NFPA's 241 plan, which is the uh, fire protection program during construction. Uh, and uh, as far as we can go with construction methods. We do not get involved in means and methods of construction, but overall concept of buildings. Um, the other four projects were able to be back online within three days because we wanted to do our evaluation. Uh, the project in question right now has been given permits to clean the site, and they are coming back in with a new project because part of their project was to revitalize one of the buildings. There were two buildings that actually came down. Um, but that now will be a total new project for evaluation. Okay. And then just to talk a little bit about your constituent services, um, I think on your website you have a goal, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the target for calls answered is at 98%. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering what your metrics were for your responsiveness to constituent calls. That, that is in our, in our paperwork. Our, our response times are very good. Mm -hmm. um, well, ISD is open because then it goes into the, 311 backup when we close, but um, you know, we have a call center, I believe, made up of six people mm -hmm. that take uh, immediate responses. Our constituent services uh, department is one, two, three, four, five people. One vacancy in, the, in that department now because Aisha was just promoted to assistant commissioner, so there's a new director's position that'll be coming up. Um, and it's their responsibility not necessarily to solve the problem. Uh, what they do is they do the historical research on the project to see if it's permitted, what the limits of it are, and then they will dispatch the appropriate inspector out to the field to see if there's a follow-up that's needed with it. But in terms of the 98% mm. in the goal, you, you, within the day hours you're meeting that? Yes, we are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. <coughs> for, thank you for coming out today. Um, Buddy, you, you generate $68 million a year. Yes. And your, your, your budget here for this year is about, this upcoming year is about $20 million. What happens with that other $48 million? Where does it go? It goes into the central fund to help support projects and programs within the city that do not generate funds. Um, it's a delicate balance, and when you look at those numbers that way, boy, does it look disproportionate in that ISD should be living in the world of lavender. Um, but the reality of it is, is you know, and I really credit the budget department, particularly the mayor and his involvement of balancing out the real needs of the city. Um, our, pro our, our The central budget, as you know, supports all kinds of programs that are across the city. Um, we think that this is, you know, as much as I advocate for my staff, which I will always do, um, I think the appropriation and the way money is, is manded out throughout the city is being responsive to times now. Um, you know, ISD is always trying to improve efficiencies and time frames, but in light of the priorities of our city, that may not be the most important thing in the city. Public safety and the fire department, police, EMTs, public health, our school systems, these are all things that really need additional assistance and don't necessarily raise uh, revenue. That was a good answer, buddy. Thank you, Frank. But I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, because I just not to, you've heard it already, different mm -hmm. people talking about um, not having enough. It doesn't seem like like you guys are, are staffed enough where, where rental rental inspections now we're talking about Airbnb, which is a whole nother thing of how we how we plan on how we plan on enforcing that I think is um, I, I mean you talk about I think you said we're gonna enforce through the data and we're gonna have people on computers enforcing that's I, I don't I don't see that happening uh, I won't I won't beat this too much buddy but you guys should have more than more of that, uh, if the math is correct, 48 million that's going into the general fund. I think if I think 
you guys need more of that. And, and, and I don't I don't know why we do this every year. I don't know why you're not. You're Council, not last, in, in, in last year we actually ended up with um, revenue at the end of our fiscal year because the, the team that's in front of you right now spends every dollar the most efficiently as we can. Um, and as I say, adding bodies, although that's the common thought pattern, usually doesn't solve the problem because if those bodies don't have a direct plan or aren't managed efficiently, I don't know what we're adding to, to the mix. Um, yes, I would, I would love to see it so that you could walk in and walk out with the permit. I would love to see that. But I also realize that the, the nuances of um, very complicated things like zoning, like building code, they prevent these things from being instantaneous, but at the same time, they provide life safety. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud to say that there's not been a fatality due to a building, at least since I've been commissioner. Uh, and so that's something that I take absolute pride in my staff's ability to really analyze these situation and promote the, safe, the best safe environment that's, that's possible. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Um, back to the, back to the, to the dry ice. Um, it, it, do we, do you just pack that down the holes? Is that how it's, it's, it's the simplest technology. I love it. Um, it's really at my level. You know, you find a rat hole and pack it, you fill it with dry ice, dry ice, you kick over some dirt over the top of it. Um, as the, uh, it starts, you know, uh, turning to a gas, it'll show you where other rat holes are on that burrow. Repeat the same process. Um, go away for 48 hours, come back. Any of the rat holes that have been disturbed because you kicked dirt over it, because the dry ice itself will be gone. Um, you, you redo the process. Um, and I think one of the nicest things about it is the rat's already buried. Yeah, be, be, good, good point. Yeah, because it is the springtime. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm starting to get those, those calls now. Um, will you talk a little bit about your external, your external funds? Where do they go? Like it, it, it's, are they just your revolving funds for animal control, foreclosure funds, <coughs> weights wait and wait measures? Where, where does the external money come from? How much, how much do you use? And All right, the um, animal control, which I know is a separate hearing, but um, basically that's the money that's used to pay for our vet, for our medicines. That's generated by the sale of licenses um, as we go forward. That's, that's a number that um, we've had animal care now for three years. Um, the budget that we're looking at is a little bit different than what the budget was before. Um, the city's plan is to address the efficiencies of the animal shelter itself. The city has appropriated $100,000 to do this analysis so that we can figure out what the right place for animal care and what it should look like. So that's one of it. Weights and measures, uh, their residual funding comes from fines and fees. That's all put into the reinvestment of that department. Um, they have some very specialized tools, as you can imagine, weights and volume meters and uniforms that they wear. We have a couple of trucks that are used for heavy scale um, balancing. That all goes, goes back into that. And the floor, foreclosure fund um, does almost go right back into uh, the legal department, primarily, believe it or not, for programs, computer programs and things to maintain the, the, the basis of the uh, foreclosure fund, which we see rapidly decreasing. The foreclosure fund. Yeah, and, which, and, and how is that? Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the that's, that's a fund? really good thing. Each property that um, goes into foreclosure is supposed to notify ISD. I believe it's $100 a month uh, fee that they pay for us to maintain that. But as that number drops, that indicates to us that there is less foreclosures. Um, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know the value of what's going on in Boston in every single community. So as we see that going down, was that, you know, that means less absentee landlords, less constituents losing their housing and things. It's a very small part of, of our bigger problem, but it is one that, that's showing real positive. And, and staying on foreclosures, what, you remember 88 Milton Street, uh, um, which we finally were able to take over and, and, mm -hmm. and, and now a, a first time home buyer is in there. Um, are we coming across, so, so I'll cut right to the chase, I have a building now where man was in there for his whole life, no, no heirs, um, he was a hoarder, house is on, house is on a, you know, a, nice, a nice street, he's been dead for two years now, there's raccoons in there and, and mm -hmm. everything else, so what, what do you have 
like to help us in, in the neighborhood move that property along. It's, we're not going to have to look at it for, for 10 years like we did. Well, you may have to look building. at it for 10 years. Unfortunately, when, especially if there isn't a clear title of ownership yeah. and then it goes into probate, yeah, that takes forever. Yeah. Um, the commitment from ISD is first we try to locate the responsible party. In some cases, it's the bank that holds the money. Um, sometimes there's a trust that's set up that, that we can tap into. They do have the responsibility, even if the litigation is going on over the ownership of the property, to maintain a safe environment, to maintain the yard, and the building's uh, supposed to be sealed. So, so if there's no ownership, though, buddy, if the, if, if the gentleman that was living in there passed away, mm -hmm. probably, no, probably no mortgage on it, it's just sitting there. How, so We how have to we go get clear title through the, through the court system. And that's... It, it, is, That's it, is that the with thing. Ed Colburn and he exactly. starts it and okay is that a will, will that be a similar thing of what's going well, on I, on I, Mount I, Ida Road? I always try to be positive about everything. <laughs> otherwise, I'd how's be that working for you? Otherwise, I'd be <laughs> suicidal. <laughs> uh, but I, I I think that the, the housing court judges understand the importance of this. I mean, they're they're always the one-offs that cause the, the biggest amount of public awareness. Um, we do have success at this. Um, the bad ones are bad, and we, we fight and put a lot of resources into that. Uh, but I, it, it's our hope that people, you know, are responsible. Some of the worst characters we had were actually banks that were outside of the city of Boston. Yeah. They have no need, and they can throw a little bit of a legal argument against us, and it forestells the process, you know, six, ten months at a time. Um, but we've got a commitment, and we do it through uh, our, our board up uh, program that received more funding this year from the city as well, so that if we get a landlord that is totally non-responsive or laid up in court, we will go out and board up properties. Uh, clean it and lean it is another program that we use where we'll do all this. We'll clean your, we'll cut the grass, you know, fix the doors, um, tow the car off the lot but then we put a lien against the property. Yeah. It's not, you know, the best financial commitment of, of money, but I think it's absolutely imperative that we do it for neighborhoods because one of these projects can absolutely destroy a neighborhood. Yeah. So I'm going to give you an address okay. after when we're done. In, in um, Austin, what are we doing with organics? I'm composting. Composting. I'm composting, uh, Councillor. We've got a program that's called... Uh, Project Oscar. It uh, started as a pilot program a few years ago where we do community composting. So this is instead of going from each and every house in the city of Boston, which may or may not have compost, it really is a program that allows the folks who feel passionately about this to take any of their leftover materials to a community bin, and then the Public Works Department will come and collect that compost and process it. Uh, we've had the, the opportunity to do that, I think, in... in Hold on a second. So process it. How is Public Works processing it? Uh, I believe they take it to save that stuff. I would have to double check with you on that, but they take it to a third party vendor who then uh, takes the, the compost and, and processes it. Okay, so I have an idea with that. $48 million, can we build a, a, a composting processing site and then we can create jobs and we can start for real composting? Um, I was in New York City. I, I went to look at some of their, the way they're doing things similar. So they do a, they do a commuter drop off at, a, at the train stations. You bring your bag, you put it in. There's, there's, there's city people there from sanitation, and then, and then it's attached to um, foundations that that are doing this work. They, it, and then that compost goes to a, goes to a um, community garden, that does all the composting themselves. So it, it doesn't go to a third party vendor. They use the material and, and, and they use their relationships. They leverage relationships to to um, to do to do all that work. And and I think it's time that we start doing something for real. I know I know Council O'Malley agrees with me, but I would be I would be hard pressed to 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 support something that collected compost and then we go to another third party vendor. I, I, I think years ago when we, we stopped doing our own snow plowing, we don't do our own collections anymore. New York City, New York City does all their own trash collection. They do all their own tipping. They're not, they don't, ha they don't have to deal with, with, with contracts. And I think it's, we have an opportunity in front of us to start the discussion. I mean, you, Buddy has $48 million every year. 
you know, that goes into wherever it goes. He had a good answer for it, but I'm not really sure where it goes. It goes into the general fund, then just gets sprinkled around. I think we should be targeted with that sort of money, and if it comes under your department, I think it might fall on you to, to, to advocate for us, the city of Boston, to do something like that. Let's be a leader here, and I'm gonna win with that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And uh, just uh, thank you for your advocacy on that as well, and I, I, thanks for uh, going to New York. and. As you know, Council, we're doing a zero waste plan in coordination with Chief Osgood, uh, who is over the Public Works and Transportation Department. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a study. One of the things that is going to be looking at, that we are looking at, is how we can do a better job with our organics and, mm -hmm. and composting, whether that is a, a curbside program or otherwise. Uh, we've got the folks who implemented the program for San Francisco uh, working on that for us. Uh, they. Uh, in San Francisco, as I'm sure you know, Councillor, but just for everyone else, uh, they've got an 80% diversion weight. Uh, whereas With organics? Uh, across the board. So or, including organics, construction, recycling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they, they send 80% of their waste gets diverted away from landfill. In uh, Boston, if we hit 20%, we're having a pretty good day. And yeah. so we've got a long way to go, and that's why Mayor Walsh asked us to do this zero waste planning process as part of our, our broader initiatives on how we get the city to be carbon neutral. As that plan wraps up, the, the whole idea on the timing of it is, as you know, our hauling contracts are, are coming up to being due, so we wanted to have the recommendations coming out of this planning process ready to go so that we could incorporate them as we go out to the market and figure out how we can move the needle on some of our waste initiatives. So it's, we'll certainly make sure yeah, to keep it, you apprised and your staff apprised of all of the, the work that we're doing on that. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I think, I know I said I was done, but give me a minute here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, and again, we get back to streamlining and, and we need less people to do this. I was in a city department, department that just got streamlined right out, of, right out of all of our jobs. And I think with the new technology, and I can't stress this enough, we should be on the front end. We should have our own facility. We, you, you know, there's people doing good work. Bruce Fulford out there. He should be supported. We should, we, uh, you know, we should be looking at these these things and really support them. Really get behind them. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would be remiss since we were discussing rodents and such to not. I uh, recognize the work of John Meany and a childhood friend of mine, Chris McNally, who responds very quickly to all of our well, we get Leo Boucher as and well. Leo, of course, Leo. I, I, I don't want to go down this road or else <laughs> it'll never end. Council O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, add my voice, Colleen Kennedy, Lisa Coveney, Frank D'Amato, Brian Ronan, Keith Barry do amazing work. Uh, they're incredibly responsive, grateful for them, among the others. Um, you know, obviously there are are other areas in the department where there's room for improvement, and I want to begin by echoing the sentiments made by several colleagues, which you don't hear at many budget hearings, um, the need for increased staffing because of the sheer number of the size of the portfolio that you have to oversee. Um, I appreciate your remarks, Commissioner. As you've said several times before, it's not about throwing money at a problem. It's about managing people better, and I think that is true to an extent. But I do think there's a number of initiatives here where um, we need to see improvement, not the least of which are so many of these new things that you're undertaking. And that's how I'd like to start my line of questioning. Um, Chief, I assume the plastic bag ordinance will come under ISD in terms of implementation. So it's a collaboration between the Environment Department as well as with ISD. Uh, so once that ordinance went into effect, uh, Commissioner Specter and Commissioner Christopher got together. The enforcement of the ordinance is going to be led out of ISD. Uh, okay. the, the policy work uh, and the community engagement components in terms of working with our vendors, uh, our small retail shops, uh, that's going to be staffed out of the Environment Department. And the mayor recommended some funding uh, for that as well. Okay, so can you, either you or Buddy, can you just sort of talk about where we are? I know we had one. Uh, Councilor Wu and I did one sort of working session. We have another one slated for a couple of weeks from now. Can you sort of talk about where we are in the process in terms of alerting people, 
um, both businesses, consumers, and then sort of the inspection piece. If I yeah, deal. sure, so. I could, I'll start it and then I'll hand Ooh. it over to Buddy. Um, so where we are, as I mentioned, we're getting the, the resources to do the community engagement uh, with your approval in the, the FY19 budget. Uh, so we've already started the process of trying to put together a job description for that role. So uh, you're going you're to hire a person who's going to be under your shop who's going to sort of oversee. Uh, they're going to be in the environment department, yep. uh, but then they're going to be working very closely with the staff in uh, Commissioner Christopher's okay. shop as well, uh, where we're going to have the enforcement start. Um, Commissioner Christopher's team has really drafted uh, what the the enforcement mechanisms will look like uh, for and which shops will start with based on their square footage and what their resources are. Uh, and that's something that he and Commissioner Specter are going back and forth on so that by the time the, the ordinance takes full force, we'll be ready to go with that. But anything you want to add to that? No. So, so walk me through a little bit about how are you going to go into these shops? Is an inspector going to, are we sending letters to every shop owner? So the, the plan is to, to have this resource on board because obviously as, yeah. as we're talking about we've got the inspectors who are going to these locations and they've got a lot of work to do already. So we'll have this community engagement person that's going to be really starting that process particularly with the shops that are going to be under under the, the ordinance first and, and having a conversation, letting them know that the ordinance is going to be in place, what that means, uh, and making sure that we do that in a fashion so that they can go through, they can start planning their orders for whatever types of bags that they will be planning on using, uh, if that's a, a concern that they have or a challenge that they have, um, getting their feedback on it and helping them from that policy perspective in the meantime. Uh, Buddy's team will continue to be able to do, at weights and measures, will be able to continue to do the inspections that they're doing. Um, and we'll get them trained up on how to do the enforcement. And once that comes into play, then they'll start that and should be seamless. So this person won't be hired until the budget is passed? Well, it's the reason why we're working on the job description now. Um, we want to make sure that we're ready to go once we have the resources in place. But this... This law goes into effect seven months from now. Right, and the budget, uh, hopefully with your approval, will go into effect in a, a couple months. That should give us some time. If, if, I, if I could add to that, too, um, what Austin's talking about, the public piece, we're not involved in. The ordinance is written, and we're in the final stages of it. We're going to step it out in three different phases, depending upon the size of the stores, weights and uh, measures the people that actually visit the stores on a regular basis will be actually the enforcers. Part of our constituent services team will be bringing this information out to the neighborhoods so that they understand that this is going into place. We're obviously starting with the much larger, you know, box stores and working down. And has, uh, that, has that started already? No, it has not started yet. We're in the, the, the last stages of finalizing the ordinance right now. Well, the ordinance has been finalized I'm sorry, and written. The process right okay. now. The ordinance did not take into consideration process at all. I, I I, I'm sorry. What do you mean by that? I think what Buddy is talking about is Buddy that can't I, speak for himself. <laughs> I, I think what he's just talking about is in terms of what level of square feet we were going to start with, and for at the and how long we were going to give each of those different locations to to come online. Okay, is that what you meant, Buddy? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, as someone who wrote the ordinance, I think uh, the process was included in it, and the discretion was left to your boss's uh, mm -hmm. opportunity to decide prioritization of the size. For the record, my boss is the mayor. Oh, fair enough. Well, the mayor's mm -hmm. chief of energy and environment, who's sitting next to you, and mm -hmm. it says specifically that he or she, whomever holds that position, will uh, prioritize reaching out to stores. Now, that's fine, and if you have problems with the ordinance, mm -hmm. there was a whole two-year period where you could have weighed in on this. So uh, I am a little bit taken aback with your tone towards this right now. Um, I think that what I am finding a little bit disappointing in is that we're seven months out from this going into effect, and I understand the position not being filled yet because of budgetary constraints. <laughs> but. I would urge your inspector and your um, team to begin this conversation now because 
There's a lot of time. There's a lot of questions. I am fielding questions now. It is my understanding that we, despite my request for a web page to be put up, that has not happened yet. And we have a lot of work to do that hasn't been done. Uh, I'll check with the staff. I believe that that was supposed to be on the, on the website, Counselor. I believe that was supposed to be up at some point this week. So okay. if it's not up already, uh, we'll certainly get an update back to you on that. Okay. Um, the other ordinance that this that I'm very proud to have worked on with my colleagues here was passing the puppy mill bill. And Commissioner Christopher, that went into effect January 1st. Have you had any inspections? Um, I know there's at least one pet store in the chairman's district that was yeah. selling. Uh, have you gone in there to make sure that they are in compliance with the law? They had one year to comply, I believe was my understanding from the last ordinance, but we haven't run into any problems with this at all. Have you gone in to check? The year expired in January. Yes, yes. I'm sure the inspector says Amanda's uh, department there is very proactive on that. I've got no report of any violation of that ordinance at all. Okay. And then finally, uh, do you currently have a list? Another thing that we've been working on is sort of uh, looking at the vacant properties in terms of our business districts. Does such a list exist? Would that come under you or come under uh, economic development? It would not come under us. We don't maintain a list of vacancies. Okay. Now that's all I have for now, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor and Asabi George. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for uh, being here this morning. I have a um, couple of questions. One on the actual budget reporting numbers. You've listed FY17 actual, FY18 appropriated, and what you're requesting in this current budget. The FY17 actual, is that what actually was spent, or is that what was approved by the council? That was, that's what was approved, Mary. That's what was approved. Can you tell us what was actually spent? I think that just looking through some of my old notes in the report, it's off by a little bit, but I am curious about what the actual spent was. Oh, I can get back to you on that one. That would be yes. great. I think it's, it's very helpful to have mm -hmm. the most accurate data. And then on the FY18, the, the current um, fiscal year that we're in, the appropriation was 19.3, but I think I thought looking through my notes that we approved... Um, 18.5, but maybe that's me looking back to 17. Are we on on pace to spend what's been a, what was approved last year? We'll have the surplus. We'll have the surplus. Yes. Great. So what's the what's the um, approximate spend this year through the operating budget? Is um, 18.4. Great. Oh, that's good to know. Um, I think uh, just it's some some of the departments will just refer back to what was approved to, instead of what was actually spent. And I think that's, that's, that's an important number to have. And that's the projection. That's good. Savings are always good. Um, thank you for that. What is, uh, in 311 and the calls related to ISD, what's the general breakdown in the, the types of calls that you get for 311, Commissioner? Uh, Councilor, they're, they're all over the place. The, uh, obviously, on weekends, it's about working without permits or the question of working without permits. Um, we are part of anything that happens in, in the form of a failure or, or a dangerous situation to a building. Uh, during the week, uh, the primary thing is, is my permit finished yet? And that's the 311 calls? The 311 calls that come into ISD, yeah. Not trash barrels, not... Um, we get a percentage yeah. of them, but they're, they're, they're not very high volumes. It's all generally permits. Very good. Um, on sharps, um, when we talked last year, there was a large number of sharps that your department comes across mm -hmm. and then deals with the mobile sharps unit for pickup. Can you talk a little bit about the experience over this last year? It, it is uh, pretty much the same as, as it was last year. The sharps program has grown so that they're able to be a lot more responsive in, 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 in the pickups, but we are still uh, deferring to them in situations where we run into uh, sharps. And do you know about the collection number or the, the number no, of sharps? So I think we were thinking maybe about 30,000 last year the, across the city. And what's the delay in a sharps um, issue, incident, to the work of your employees? I don't know if Is I Is there a delay in work um, when they come across the sharps? Is there, you know, there was, I think, one of the incidences from last year, just referring to my notes, was there was a hoarding situation with a, with mm -hmm. a resident then there was an ISD call. Is it man hours that a representative from your department is waiting for the mobile sharps team to come in? And no, not, not, not in any great proportion at all. Um, the, when we go to a situation where we know it's hoarding, that we will notify public health 
um, in their shops team that, that we're going in there. Um, if we run into a situation where we do have an, an abundance of shops to be removed, we will work around that situation. There, there are many other things that we can be doing while that's scheduled. I think the shops recovery team has, has done a fantastic job. And I know in dealing with us, mm -hmm. they are very responsive. Yeah, no, no doubt. Um, have ISD employees been trained in um, needle disposal? No. And are they at risk for needle sticks? They're aware of their situation and are trained to back off from the situation until it's cleared. So they're trained in proto needle protocols? No, I wouldn't say that. We've not instructed them on the pickup or anything, just the avoidance of, of the situation until the appropriate people can deal with it. All right. Many of our departments across the city have been trained in proper needle um, disposal and handling of needles, whether it's the parks department, whether it's the school department, especially mm -hmm. with our custodial staff, but teaching staff has been trained um, in needle protocol. Is that something that is worth the investment at ISD is to train your employees and proper I, disposal? I think awareness would be, would be uh, an appropriate thing for them for us to start dealing with the shops would be something else that would take these people away from their primary, primary responsibility of the life safety issues in the building. But any form of education, I think, is a positive thing for ISD. Okay, I, I just want to reiterate that we've got librarians and library staff mm -hmm. that are disposing of needles. We've got school teachers and custodians removing. We've got park staff removing. We've got uh, information shared with parents and little league coaches on proper disposal of needles. So I would imagine that there's a point that ISD and your employees may want to also be trained properly in uh, disposal and handling of sharps. On animal care and control, uh, how many, uh, what's the percentage of the budget that's spent on that, on that department? Uh, the budget's a line item in, in our budget account. We can tell you exactly what it is. They're part of the whole budget. But yeah. there isn't a special, uh, uh, it's a separate not, line item for separate, animal no. control. Do you mean their um, their revolving fund? Or not the just, revolving no, fund. No, in just general, they're part of ISD. Okay. Uh, how many? Um, you know, what's how many hearings are held with animal control um, and care? Do, you know, dog nuisance calls. We, we can or dig it other. up. It's it's on an ad need basis. Uh, we do not have as many hearings as issues that we resolve by discussions with owners or, or situations that develop. How many staff members are in animal control? Uh, we have, I believe, Patty. Um, hi, so we have four animal room attendants. Um, we have one director staff who's- Who's the, as a, Amanda. Who's Amanda, Who's yeah. wonderful, It's great. And then we also have an administrative assistant staff. Um, we have, let me, we have two supervisor dog officers and the actual amount of dog offices, hold on one second, I'm sorry. Eight or nine. Eight. So about 15 altogether that are yes. focused on animal care and, and control. Yep, and we also have um, one clerical staff at the shelter and two clerical staff stationed at ISD who work directly with the animal control. All right, so about 18, that's great. Um, I think that as, um, as, the, I don't even know how to phrase this right, but we, you know, we, get, we get calls into our office about um, challenges with off-leash dogs in many of our parks. And it's, you know, it's some dogs that are well-behaved and some, I suppose it's really the owner. Um, some of the owners are more are better behaved than other owners, but sort of balancing that relationship between dog owners uh, dogs off of leash and in some of our parks where it's probably not most appropriate for dogs to be if there's a baseball game happening or a soccer game happening. The call, unfortunately, could go in about an off-leash dog, but where we, when we're not necessarily staffed, you know, 400% or 800% or whatever the number would be to be at every park across the city, it's, it's one of the challenges we face as um, counselors for the calls that we get, but then also as, you know, if I'm at the ball field with the kids, mm -hmm. getting the, a quick response is really difficult. So I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that. What we've done is we've prioritized the animal calls that come in. Uh, and off-leash is not a, a 
it's not the number one or number two response times. A dangerous dog situation is definitely a number one. If so if you're at a ballpark and there's a dog that is exhibiting, you know, um, aggression towards, you know, children or other dogs, we dispatch to that immediately. As far as the off-leash goes, what we're doing, we're working very closely with the Parks Department, and it's really about an educational program that goes in. We do have the authority and do issue tickets to people who either don't clean up after their pets or are not on leash. Um, again, that's almost a case-by-case -case story, whether it's successful or not. Can we tell where some of those calls are coming from the oh, most yeah. and sort of prioritize where we should be looking to add dog runs and, or and dog we, parks? And we do. M Street Park was, was the biggest. Um, and we have the best dog uh, uh, park right across the street. Um, but M Street was was by far the biggest. Ronan Park was another one that had uh, a lot of uh, dog calls. So we do, when the officers are not being dispatched on a call and they're in the city, we have them go to the parks and literally walk around yeah. so that we're using their time. And I know one of the mayor's coffee hours, um, Amanda was there and had, um, had to write a ticket for somebody for, I think, a, an aggressive dog which was just, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's, I think it, it is a combination of education mm -hmm. and greater awareness. Um, my last question is about um, a, a cap, the capital project for the animal shelter and mm -hmm. the building program and any assessment of siting options. What, what the uh, planning budget, the budget office has started is, is an investment into that planning department. They've allocated a $100,000 study for the site location and development of the project. Uh, we know that we have two, two sites right now that we're looking at, but uh, it was felt it was more important to do a more comprehensive citywide study as opposed to what we had done at ISD. And in the meantime, property management is maintaining the building at Mahler Road. And is that a building that we own as a city? Yes. And we looking for a location that we also own? We haven't started the study yet, Council, so I'm not sure exactly what the direction is. Obviously, we'd prefer to prioritize property that we own, right. but if it proves that there's a better location for another reason, I'm sure it's not off the table. No, we just as a city, we have a lot of lease, leases that um, mm -hmm. we're spending significant amounts of money on property we don't own as a city. So I, I, would, um, I would hope that there's a priority if not only an exclusive search of property that we own as a city, um, or if there was a partnership with a state agency, perhaps, um, so that we aren't leasing uh, and, and spending yeah. resources on, on private property. That is it for me, Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siomo, um, and thank you guys for being here, and thank you for your hard work. I echo the thank yous to your team members, um, who are usually our first line of contact um, at your respective uh, departments, and who are amazing. Um, and I have to add, I know Colleen, we work with quite a bit, but Amanda as well, um, is very responsive and, and gets a lot of things done, so thank you. Um, I Most of my questions have been asked and answered. I have more questions related to the um, the as a right hearing that we held and commissioner thank you again for being there the goal is to take some of the ideas we heard and um, at that hearing and also emails I've also I've received from folks since that hearing um, to compile what people are talking about that may be short-term and long-term solutions as to improve community sort of Pro community process or expand community process. I know um, we also talked about zoning and changing zoning and the complications and, and the heavy lift that that is, particularly having to interface with the State House. But at some point, I'm looking forward to having a working session and having you back to talk mm -hmm. through some of these ideas, given your expertise and those of your team. Um, I'd be curious just on some of the things that we did talk about, simply just around notification, mm -hmm. whether it's emails going out, um, whether it's notifying not just owners of record, but tenants in uh, the buildings um, who frankly live there and the owner may live outside of Boston. I'm assuming that's gonna require some level of resource or maybe it well, won't be, I, I don't know. I've had discussions with um, ONS about the best way to develop this. Our first pass on it is to develop a, a, a web-based uh, piece of information so that everyone could have access to it. Um, as I discussed uh, that night at the Great Hall, that we don't keep records of residents, we keep records of owners. 
Okay. So that piece, uh, I know the community felt was critically important because we have more residents than we do owners. Uh, but we thought the web-based uh, situation or solution may be the best way for anyone who is interested to be able to have access to that information. And if we sent, so we have, but for example, we could see that owners um, say, uh, I'll use an address in Dorchester again, um, you know, Ocean Street, we see that the owner uh, of record, another address pops up for that person. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, um, what is it, you know, what might it cost to actually send a mail, mailing notification to that address as well as to the owner of record at the other um, address? Mary, what do we spend on mailings for the Board of Appeals right now? Uh, board of Appeal mailing, so, um, about 40000 a year. Yeah, so it's well, and that's just for Board of Appeals actions. Okay. Um, well, that's, just, I mean, some of that is what I look forward to discussing in the hearing, sure. understanding that there might be a cost attached to some of these solutions and ideas, um, but I think some are very reasonable and worth it, particularly if um, folks say, oh, I didn't know about it, and we say, no, actually, we sent it information out to you and then if they don't show up then that's yeah. that's different we're, we're exploring as, as many possibilities as we can for public notification um, the web although is is one very effective tool it is not all encompassing mm -hmm. um, so there are other um, methods that are being used by other departments throughout the country that we're looking into now each carries you know a financial burden um, that we've got to address somehow how do, how do we pay for these things to be done uh, so we're hoping to have some more stuff so a working session will be the the best uh, you know venue for us to be able to explain and discuss this no i think that's great and and web-based i know um the civics would love that because mm. folks are saying i used to get this and now i don't but if there's a, a system where they can sort of go into um as well as constituents that that'd be great um I don't have any more questions after that. I look forward to continuing the conversation during the working session. I will say um, I'm an energy person, <laughs> so that little tit for tat or whatever that was, mm -hmm. um, frankly, was really uncomfortable. But I, I will say we're not always going to agree on all the issues um, or the processes, but we're all in this together. I mean, I think we each represent um, different districts or the city as a whole. Um, and so how do we work together to move things forward? How do we stay in communication um, as we're doing this? How do we, of course, acknowledge the hard work that you guys have and vice versa the hard work and I got an email today from a guy who just kept going on and on and being frankly crazy um, so it's not easy work but you know I think the council and each of us is in partnership with you guys um, and if it doesn't feel that way then let's continue the conversation to change that but Commissioner thank you for the hard work thank you for coming to some of my civic meetings as well particularly UNA I'm always happy when they see you and chief and, and you guys thank you very much for the hard work that you guys do thank you thank you thank Council you Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Siumo. I had a qu uh, question for Chief Blackman. Um, can you describe a little about the relationship between the Water and Sewer Commission um, in your office as it relates to Fort Point and the, uh, the flooding that's taking place down there? What steps are you taking? Uh, what is some of the public outreach that you're doing? I know that you are working working hard down there, but if you can give us a little background information, that'd be helpful. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the Boston Water and Sewer Commission is one of our major partners on the effort that we're doing across the entire city called Climate Ready Boston, but in particular as it relates to the Fort Point Channel and South Boston as well. Uh, this is an effort where we're not only trying to understand where we are vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, uh, but then also in from a climate preparedness perspective as well. So looking at that from our stormwater infrastructure uh, where we work very closely with the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority as well as the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. And uh, in the Four Point Channel as well as some of the work that we've done in Charlestown and East Boston, we're now at the point where we're trying to understand what are the conceptual projects that we can do to, that would be that would in getting those to a place where they're shovel ready so that we can actually move forward and implement them so we've announced some projects in east boston and charlestown already uh, so protecting the east boston greenway with a temporary flood wall uh, and also elevating main street in the sullivan square area uh, but as it relates to the fort point channel and the the work that we're doing there one of the challenges is We've got quite a few private sewers that have been unmarked, um, and so the Boston Water and Sewer 
uh, authority is continuing to evaluate some of those areas because if they're not properly um, equipped, they can actually be flood entry pathways uh, if the tide comes high enough. Even if you have a flood wall or, or additional protection, if the, the weight of the water can push through and through those channels, then you can actually get back, um, back channels into the street. And so that's a major component of the work that the Boston Water and Sewer Commission is doing. We work very closely as well with the Parks Department. As you're well aware, we have Martins Park on the Fort Point Channel. Uh, we're making an investment there to make that park more climate resilient uh, as well. And of course, we work closely with the Boston Planning and Development Agency uh, as they review projects and as they have conversations with some of our property owners in the city of Boston, uh, they use the analysis and the projections that we have in terms of the elevations in the Fort Point Channel, South Boston and elsewhere to help the developers understand what they need to do with their site and with their buildings in order to make them climate prepared uh, as far into the future as possible. Thank you, Chief. And I have one final question for the Commissioner. Commissioner, this weekend I was in Chinatown Bay Village in the South End doing Love Your Block cleanups with some of the residents there. Um, many concerns about the rat problem, mm -hmm. um, especially, in, especially in Chinatown and in the Bay Village as well. Um, are developers and contractors doing enough to you know, set traps? Are they effectively setting the traps, um, making it easier to catch these rats? Or do we need to be working closely, uh, closer with them to give them more instruction on how to do this? On the construction side, they're required to do an inspection pre-development, maintain uh, uh, catching during the project, and then there's a post-development point of view. Uh, the thing we found that worked the best in Chinatown was the first place we had done it two years ago where we did a block-by-block -block program where we you know, went out and explained how to manage some of the trash. Working with Public Works, we actually changed some of the collection processes in Chinatown. Um, and to me, that's the biggest thing. So I think um, contractors are doing their job. They could always be more vigilant as, as we do it. But it's also the management of a lot of our trash is, is the source of a lot of infestation. There was one street I was at over the weekend. It's, it's a private street. It's Oxford Place in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, and I was walking by there on Saturday. A lot of, a lot of rats running around. But since it's a private street, um, is this still a responsibility for the city of Boston to do any setting of traps in that area? We're responsible for all public ways. So we do that, and we do go further into that in cases where there's a dispute of ownership or problems of an absentee landlord. So we are on, on, on top of that. But it's usually, if you're seeing rats, they're usually not rats just by themselves. There's usually you know, a trash situation that's associated with it. And that's the thing that we can be the most proactive with, is to, is to kill that source. Thank you, Commissioner. And maybe um, we can talk offline, but is there, maybe we can talk about some type of PSA announcements for residents and uh, business owners in Chinatown as it relates to this issue. Maybe oh. I can get a little bit of feedback from you as well. Yeah, and we also will have our teams come out to any group that wants to sit and talk about it as, as an educational piece. It doesn't have to be like you know, an organized business association or anything, but a group of neighbors want to get together or uh, business owners, we're more than happy to come out and ex explain it. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd like to maybe arrange that over the next um, next month or so if you if you're interested a absolutely happy to counsel thank you commissioner thank you uh counselor wu um i'm good i'll follow up offline thank you okay counselor flaherty um yeah just uh, want a uh, quick follow-up on um on your notes here on um Um, on the, um, we're going to be meeting on it fairly soon, uh, Commissioner, on the sandwich board. So, can yeah. you just talk a little bit about, from your perspective, the success of how it stands right now, which is a, it's a currently in a pilot form, yeah. and we're looking to sort of 
um, we, that a few from our point of view, um, code enforcement is, is the recording body of violations and things. Mm -hmm. We're told from them the number of uh, violations are less than five in the past 18 months when the program went into place. So for, from our point of view, this program seems to be working. And one of the we, concerns we had, if you recall, it was concerns over, say, like the, the landlord um, sort of maybe dictating or whoever was paying right. the highest rent got the biggest spot on the sandwich board. Are you seeing any of that? N none process? of that because we're seeing multiple uh, sandwich boards uh, based upon the number of occupants in, in the building. And that I know was one of the biggest complaints. The concern for us was one one billboard or one sandwich board per a building would result in a cottage industry that that would become revenue generating space for advertising. Whereas if everybody's responsible for their own, we, we, we would hope to uh, defeat that before it happened. And then the issue where we had the sandwich boards literally blocking people's um, pathways mm -hmm. on the side streets and the local business districts, have you seen a decrease in that? Because we, we haven't seen that really start generating itself. We've limited the size of the billboard, the height of the billboard, the sandwich board, because that's a, that's a bad mistake. Yeah. Um, and we're not seeing the problem being reported to us. We will double check with code enforcement, but my last discussion with them was, as I say, very, very, very minimal infractions. That's right. And then, um, and you were on it this year, um, and obviously just uh, as we're moving forward um, into the fall, the focus has been, it's pr pr primarily it's been in um, Council Siomo's district with the student move-in, mm -hmm. and you and I had this conversation is that as our neighborhoods are, uh, are becoming more gentrified and we're getting the younger population, we're probably, many of the other neighborhoods are getting a lot of the graduate students. But it seems as though it, for the longest time it was Austin Brighton, uh, for the most part, really Mission Hill, in Mission Fenway Hill, area. Fenway area, really, mm -hmm took the brunt of it um, sort of at that September 1st move in. Uh, we're now sort of starting to see that sort of spread in other pockets of the city. Across the well. city, so yes. I know you were on it um, last year and just asked that you continue to be vigilant on that. Uh, Savin Hill, South Boston, East Boston, Charlestown, the downtown saw a huge influx. Um, as uh, Again, as our college universities are growing, but also as uh, more jobs are coming here, uh, folks that used to get the diploma and head back to where they came from are now staying in Boston and uh, they're living in many of the different neighborhoods outside of the traditional sort of a, where there's a heavy student population. Uh, so, but you, you we're paying yeah. close the attention student, to The that. student accountability report is showing to us that there is, you know, a migration across the city. Um, and, you know, the past three years we, we've taken, you know, great success and great pride in the work that we've done interdepartmentally across, across the board. Uh, we've seen less of a, an impact in you know the three prime neighborhoods that we've always seen as the impact, but we do monitor it across the city, and even that weekend, we do put teams out in all of the other areas. And I remember Councilor Siomo telling me, and even his predecessors, both Council McDermott and Council Honan, would talk about how many moving trucks would be mm. rolling in around the street, and we actually right. rest that we got a little bit of a taste of it. In my yes, own last year South Boston was was one yeah. of the neighborhoods that we really saw a lot of moving trucks. It wasn't near the, the concentration like a Mission Hill or, right. um, you know. But oh, yes, you. we are on top of that, Council. Thanks, Mr. Yeah, thank thanks. You. And, and let me just follow up to say that I've seen a tremendous improvement, in, and it, I think it's a lot in due to the, the, um, the things we do in advance of mm -hmm. the, the first of the year, having your inspectors out there in full force, doing the education piece, and I want to applaud you. Um, it's been very smooth the past several years, and uh, <laughs> great working with you on that. Thank you, uh, Councilor. Sure. Uh, Councilor Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mary, how are you today? Good. Uh, just a couple questions quickly under contracted services. Transportation of persons, what, like, can you explain that to me? The, um, do you mean the inspector amount or? Um, well, it, it's, it's under uh, Department History Contracted Services Line 52800, mm -hmm. it, it has $337,000 for transportation of persons. Well, the, the majority of that is the um, stipend that the inspectors get for using their car to do inspections. Oh, okay, so, they're in their own personal vehicle, so right. they get gas money and that sort yes. of stuff. Yes, it's, it's contractual. Okay, and, and then also under that line it says contracted services. What 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 would that encompass? Is that most of your IT or? or That's um just odds lawyers. And ends. No, not <laughs> um, the board of appeal hearing in the Boston Herald's like ninety five thousand um, printing thirty thousand yeah. um, constable services for the inspectors 
uh, for legal notices to be served. Um, so it's just every odds and ends for the department. How, how much is your printing again? 30,000. That's all you do for printing? Yes. Well, you probably do a lot of it on, on um, copying machines and that sort of stuff now. No, it goes all out printed forms. Oh, okay. Through okay. platforms. We yeah. miss North Street, though, very much. <laughs> Thank you. I remember North Street. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, buddy, do you, who, who owns your building you're in? Is that, is that property, property management? management? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, they, so do they also own the <clears throat> animal, animal shelter? Yes. So who, they, they manage the, um, they manage the maintenance in that building? The systems, yes. So, so yeah, like the HVAC system, the refrigeration systems, that is their responsibility. So what about cleaning and, and that? Cleaning, we, we have a limited budget that we, we have cleaners going into the building now. For Mallor Road? Mallor Road, yeah. I'm not sure how that oh, is. No, no, in your building, 1010. Oh, in our building, no, that's, that's uh, uh, totally that's uh, subbed out different uh, uh, group that comes in and does the cleaning and um, and, and so that that comes out of your budget to no. pay? We pay a portion of um, the building as do all the other departments in there and that is included in that. Yeah, and, and so the, the lot across the street, mm -hmm. that's owned by, by property management? Yes, yes it is. Um, and maybe you may know, you may not know what, what, what's going, because we, we had heard discussions around maybe trying to build a, a parking lot with some offices or what, is there any discussion around There's that? There's a lot of discussion just... about it right now. There are a number of people that are very interested in that lot going forward, but the mayor has set up, um, you know, a committee to look at the under use of city owned properties and our buildings. So that's one of the lots that's being considered in that program as what would be a better use and development of that building. Who's, who's on that committee? That's Do we know, do we have a sense? I'd have to get back to you on the exact folks. Yeah. I know that it's uh, 1010 has kind of come under quite a few different evaluations, including one for the Renew Boston Trust. Um, and it's also part of, as Commissioner Christopher was mentioning, it's part of this housing initiative to see if there is city-owned land that could be redeveloped, as are some of our other parcels throughout the city. Um, but it's one of the, the largest opportunities that we have, both in terms of its location and its energy use to, to make improvements, either for housing or in terms of the You're city's greenhouse. You're talking 1010 or the, or the parking lot across the street? Both. Uh, both. Oh, both. Okay, yeah. I mean, from an energy perspective, certainly 1010. Um, yeah. But in terms of the redevelopment of the entire area, um, that's both the parking lot as well as 1010 Mass Ave and a handful of other properties that are, are nearby are yeah. in the housing initiative that Chris, uh, Commissioner Christopher mentioned. Yeah, I'm not sure it's appropriate for housing down there, but that's just my two cents there. The, I don't think it's, it's not being advocated or programmed yet, but it's in this program to look at what would be the right use there. So, so this, this, this board, they're literally just going through, going yeah, there was through a, properties? There was your, a big announcement two months ago, three months ago, where, where the mayor is soliciting suggestions, ideas for property. He listed all of the city-owned properties. There was, there was a press release on it and everything. I don't okay. remember the exact date. I can get you a copy of it. Yeah, if, I know if, I have it at the office. And again, back to the, the, the services, I don't, know why we're, I don't know why we have outside companies in your building doing, doing taking care of that. Uh, again, that we, we, we should be looking at how we create jobs and, and, and you know, those, those could be jobs that we could give to people in, in the city. Um, that's a broken record now, so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Councilor Savi, George. I'm okay. You're Thank all you. set? Anybody else? All set? Great. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions. Sure. Last year at this time, you reported, I think, 116,000 registered units through the rental registry. Do you have a... Yeah, we're up to almost, I think, 170 at this point. Oh. And, Unique and, addresses. And is that almost 100%? Well... It's the target, you know, that we're looking at. We, I, I think our guesstimates are as high as 234,000 and a big wow. portion of those are public housing and things that right. are excluded. Right, I gotcha, yeah. So the, the number is growing. We, the last two years we had big jumps, mm -hmm. uh, but now we're creating a real database as we move forward. And uh, what about, um, and I can get this stuff mm -hmm. offline, problem properties, uh, increase, decline, flat, well, public properties is, is about the same. 
uh, uh, problem properties because right. um, you know that's a list that's ever changing. Mm -hmm. You know, as some properties come off because they've achieved their goals right. that, that we've defined for them, other properties uh, are quick to put, to pull into that. So there's always a replacement. Always <laughs> a replacement. Okay. And um, the five-year inspections, uh, we're, yeah. we're kind of getting past the five-year period, right? How, like, what percentage do you well, think we're at? I don't have the exact numbers, but I'll get them for you, Counselor. But we see a, a big increase in people applying for them. Mm -hmm. The application process is, is a little more rigorous than the standard uh, inspection, and you have to have a very clean uh, history on your property to you know be part of that. But the larger developments are seeing that's a real benefit to them. It's a real benefit to us as well. Right. So right. what we're seeing that steadily grow. Great. Uh, Council Baker has one. Yeah, question. just one more question, buddy. With with everything going on over UMass and 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 us trying to advocate in in the neighborhood to have UMass come in front of us for a, for a you know for for planning or zoning whatever that peninsula is going to look like. Um, do, do you guys have any role in any of that building over there? Is that all well, done by the state? It's all state property. We will support our, our state counterparts as they ask us to, and occasionally they will. I, I mean, I know we're doing electrical inspections in South Station right now, uh, but that is totally under the preview of, of the state. Really? So, so if that goes... If that goes public-private and there's, there's institutional use and also housing and and whatever else happens over there they'll inspect all that we won't e even if it's even if it's a private developer developer building you know housing we won't we the, won't even get a look at that well there are some guidelines that have to go into any state land being just developed in the state and it's and I, I can't quote it exactly but i know the state has to own a piece of it in order for it to remain outside of our review um through the through the building department Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll just add my voice to the chorus of people. Looking at your budget has been very flat. Uh, your, your personnel line's probably only gone up to satisfy some contracts, uh, union contracts. And uh, I don't know how you're doing it, but you know, I think you have a lot of support here mm -hmm. to look at um, you know, more employees. And I, we had a conversation earlier difficult recruiting them right now, yes. but anything we can do to help, uh, you know, ISD uh, impacts the quality of life of all of our residents. I, the, the one request I always have is, is notification. You see something, you got to tell us. Right. Um, and the sooner and more, more frequent you do it, the more we can be right. able to get our resources out there. Right. Well, thank you, buddy. Thank you, Austin. Uh, Mary, Mary, uh, thank you, your whole team and all the folks out in the field that respond to all of the complaints we get on a regular basis. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. and the Alston Brighton District City Councilor. Today is Monday, May 7th, and we are here uh, re regarding docket 0576, message and order authorizing a limit for the Inspectional Services Department revolving fund for the fiscal year 2019 to reimburse for administrative costs to those city agencies which enforce CBC Chapter 16, Section 1.9 and 1.9B, and for costs associated with licensing and registration fees collected pursuant to CBC Chapter 18, Section 1.46-10, and fines pursuant to CBC Chapter 16, Sections 1.9 and 1.9B. Receipts and resulting expenditures from this fund shall not exceed $300,000. Uh, I'd like to remind folks in the chamber that uh, this is a public hearing, both broadcast live and recorded on RCN 82, Comcast Channel 8, and Verizon 1964, streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd ask uh, folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. 
the conclusion of the, the uh, presentation, questions and answers. We will take uh, public testimony. Uh, you need to sign in to my left at the door. Uh, please state name, uh, residence, any affiliation, and mark the box uh, if you wish to testify. Uh, also, in order of their arrival, I believe, uh, to my left, Councillor Frank Baker, to my right, Councillor Anissa Sabi George, and to my far left, Councillor Ed Flynn. And we are here with Commissioner Christopher, who will give us the, uh, the presentation on animal control. Thank you for, for having us here today. Um, yes, the, the revolving front is, uh, fund for animal care is uh, a, a key element for us in order for us to provide um, medical services and supplies uh, to the shelter. Uh, it is funded by the sale of dog licenses. Um, so, you know, it, it does work into itself. It has a cap of $300,000. Uh, FY17's expenditure uh, was $2,888. Uh, and we're working towards that, um, keeping this thing rolling. Great. Um, Council Baker? Yeah. Good morning again. So the, so the revolving fund is just, it's over and above their, their operating budget. Yes. It, what is the operating budget for, for animal care and control? Do you have that? Well, they're part of ISD, so they, they don't actually have anything special. They're just part of ISD. Oh, oh so, so they're in with all your yes. FTEs and... Mm -hmm. and yes. um, in, I know it's revolving fund, but mm -hmm. buddy, what if, whatever happened with, and we're back to buildings and not investing in buildings. And I mean, we had the, mm -hmm. what was it, the caucus freezer go out last summer. It, are they, are we investing in that building there or we're, we're looking mm -hmm. to We're, we're going to maintain that building for right now while, you know, a comprehensive study is done to determine the best location for a new shelter, whether it's keeping it a mile road and reinvesting in that or if there's another lo uh, location that would be better suited for it. But the, uh, property management is investing in um, maintaining that building right now. Maybe a good location might be the um, parking lot across from 1010, maybe. Um, so whatever happened with the, with, the, with the caucus fridge, do we have to build a whole new fridge? No, no, it's, it's, it's a packaged freezer. Uh, we did have it maintained a couple of times during the summer. And right now we're in the process of, of putting together a full evaluation of it to make sure that, you know, it, it will hold its own and have a good maintenance package in place to deal with it. Okay. Um, and so the 300, where does that, where do, where do we, where do they spend this, this revolving fund? Mary can talk and about that. And I apologize that. if you already answered that. I uh, it's spent for, for the, um, the vet, the on-site vet is $70,000. A vet tech is about 16. Um, we have... 20,000 for food, medical supplies. Um, their software system is about 10 grand. And um, we have commission of the, the um, carcasses and other service to the- Okay, so are the vet and the vet, the vet tech, are they not city employees? Are they just contracts? They're contractors, Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you, Councilor Savi George. Um, how many licenses, oh, thank you. Good afternoon, I thought, um, how many licenses do we um, give out every year, issue every year for this revolving fund? I have to get back to you on that. Um, Amanda has that in, in a separate software. I didn't have that, those numbers with me. All right, and then how much is the fine and what, what are the fines for that also go into this fund? We have uh, the, the tickets for being um, off, our off, lice, off, off leash. And they're escalating. The, the first uh, fine is, is free. Uh, then I believe it's 50, 100, and then, I, and then 300 is, is the cap on that. And then what happens after that $300? It remains at $300 uh -huh. for each. And then how many tickets do we issue each year? Um, what Huh? Amanda has those yeah, though that I don't have yeah. that with me. I apologize. Sorry. It's not it's not a great uh, number of, uh, because we'd prefer to try to educate each one of these mm. people on site. The only time we'll issue a ticket if they you know disregard the animal officer or they're blatant in their in their actions. Are there any animals in the city any breeds that we muzzle no. or that we require muzzling? No. 
I am curious in the, the number of licenses, um, if you can get back to us. Yes, now we can get to you. Great, too. thank you. That's it for me, Chair. Uh, thank you, and we've been since joined by Councillor Kim Janey to my right, as well as Councillor Tim McCarthy to my left. Councillor Ed Flynn. Thank you, Councillor, and I, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you to, um, to the Commissioner. Um, since I started here, his, him and his staff have been very professional and courteous to me, so I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the Commissioner. Thank you. Councilor Janney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, just to follow up on some of the fees or fines, what are some of the things that someone could be fined for? You s I heard you mention off the leash. Off leash, um, not cleaning up after their dogs. Um, those are the two primary ones. Um, if you're not, if your dog isn't um, vaccinated, you can be f uh, fined for that. Um, I think that's it. And certain playgrounds, parks have no dogs allowed signs. Mm -hmm. What about a violation for walking your dog well, on a leash and cleaning up after it, but still walking it in a playground or park that says no dogs allowed? Uh, I don't know how that's handled, to be quite honest. It would depend on who, who the ownership of the park was, um, because the state has a lot of walking parks in our city as well. So it would depend on the, the jurisdiction for that. But I don't think it, it fits into their ordinance to, uh, for that kind of a violation. Oh. And what are the fees then used to support? They, they primarily the vet, the vet tech, uh, the uh, medicines, and you know, associated supplies with the shelter itself. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, go over quickly, the uh, total receipts last year were over 200,000 and mm -hmm. you report under 50,000 through the half the year. Do you know what, what the discrepancy is? What, what happens right? is it cycles through as the year goes along the licenses increase, mm -hmm. so it's not it's not a predictable source of income. Right. Over the course of a year, you can predict it because we do have a database of those animals that were licensed for us, and we do notify them. Right. Is there like a deadline of yeah, some kind? April, April so, is, the, is the month to license your dog. Oh, okay. So may, we might see a, a big jump oh, in yes. this then. Gotcha. Well, right now, our um, our collections are one hundred thirty nine. Thousand. Oh, okay. Yes. So you're, you're on par as, yes. as mm -hmm. far as next year, I mean this fiscal year as well. Great. Anybody else have anything? Oh, Councilor Janey. Thank you. One final question. On the enforcement side, does that just re uh, require a Good Samaritan like calling something in? How does that work? I'm not sure if I understand your question. So if there was a dog off the leash or yeah. someone not cleaning up after their dog, are there folks from your office who are patrolling the area, or does yes. someone have to call that in? No, the um, the animal officers are the ones who are the only ones who could issue that fine, and they've got to witness the violation themselves. themselves. Okay. So if we get a call of a dog uh, loose in a park, we will dispatch, depending upon the critical need of what else is going on in the city. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Thank your entire team again. And this hearing is adjourned.